So thank you for uh, following with my proposal to take a seat and uh, to start. I'm very glad to see this uh, room full of uh, people who I think we share a similar uh, values. We, we share a similar direction when it comes to the subject of uh, today's meeting. So I'm really grateful for uh, you making the time to be with us today. Uh, and without any further ado, I would like to uh, just start by saying welcome. Thank you for uh, your time and uh, thank you for uh, the European Social Committee for hosting us today. I'd like now to uh, give the floor to uh, our host, Petro Barbieri, who is the member of European so uh, Economic and Social Committee, for a few welcoming remarks. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, let me say that uh, I do. I would, I would have liked to uh, take, uh, participate more than uh, what I can, but I have a meeting at 2.30, so I really thank the SPD for organizing this meeting and to give me the, the, the floor for, as the first one, but it wasn't uh, in the program, but uh, I'm very sorry. Um, just a few words about the uh, economic, uh, European Economic and Social Committee. Um, it is addressing all level of, of its commitment to provide opinions to European institutions, which includes the issue of Russian aggression against Ukraine. Um, the, resolution, the resolutions of uh, the committee are there to prove it. The sections, in particular, those dealing with foreign policy and social policy, policy with their specific working groups, um, such as that of disability that I actually chairing, um, have dedicating interwork uh, interworking section session to um, including visits uh, to the Ukraine borders to meet the partners of economic and social Ukrainian ne networks in this regard. Concrete support was also addressed to some initiative of, to the Ukrainian partners. The, the task of, of the study groups specific on disability uh, that I have the honor of chairing is to use all possible channels to mainstream disability in this area as well. The EC um, was particularly in favor of using the extraordinary instrument that the Commission has adopted for the reception of uh, Ukraine refugees and their job placement. Hopefully this is um, this first time ever for the European Commission will open the, uh, the door for welcoming ref refugees in the event of new crisis in other parts of the world. This is support is, is uh, support is powerful and um, um, and it has made available concrete tools to the member states uh, and organizations that um, are committing of the work coming. Um, it is clear that this tool need to be renewed as soon as the crisis is underway. This is our very first point. At the same time, it must be noted that uh, these tools are not always suitable for people with disabilities, especially those in more serious conditions. The member states um, that are also carried out, uh, they will come in refugees with disability, have had to make up for the, with the financial and services in delivery by themselves. In some cases, this means that the risk of institutionalization, sorry, since the most immediate service to me, to me uh, available for each individual in member state is the most usual one, the most immediate for public institutions. Well, I have a specific case to talk about, which concerns the country where I come from. Uh, thanks to the um, um, European Disability Forum's report, I learned about the case of a woman with paraplegia uh, from Ukraine who, um, when transferred to Italy, uh, was sent to a psychiatric center. Even today, I feel the horror on my skin. They followed a completely ordinary bureaucratic procedure, uh, measuring the degree of autonomy and sending her to a public service that can guarantee her type of assistance. It was a pity that the doctor who visited, who visited her was a geriatrician with little knowledge of her pleasure. Uh, from that assessment, she resulted in high degree of care need. Um, and it was still a pity then uh, that a, a high level of assistance, uh, those same doctors are indicating a segregated venue as the, uh, the basic information, the only way out was a form of uh, segregation. Finally, 
it was again a peat heap uh, that the only structure of that nature available was the psychiatric one. We worked hard to get a, a hair out of, uh, of there. Uh, this experience speaks for itself, despite the commitment of the Association of People with Disability in Italy, both to change the approach to, the, to this bureaucratic and segregating way, and to welcome the Ukrainian refugees with disabilities, uh, there is still consolidated method that tends to segregate the person, persons with disability. Well, I could continue on the topic of other refugees with disability that I'm aware of. A car caravan of about 50 people with disabilities are, uh, arrived in, in my city, uh, which is Rome. Initially, they were uh, host, uh, housed in a hotel with a very high cost of in in inadequate services. The institutions have a soft alternative solution within the system of the ordinary reception of Ukrainian refugees without any success, except for a group of 10 hosted by the organization they, they personally chair. The others are still in the hotel, still now, after months. The reason is because the ordinary reception system is based on some structural, professional, and economic standard dictated by inadequate agreements uh, at a EU level with the European Commission. These are not ex expected to be accessible, for example. The professional and, and the expected remuneration are very, uh, 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 are of a very low profile and therefore need for a specific assistant, assistance of any kind and cannot deliver um, at all. If there is something that I um, uh, that have to be addressed is that the emergency system must be able to be accessible in the broader sense. There is have the, at least the basic standards available uh, that makes it uh, accessible implementing Article 11 of the United Nations uh, Convention of Rights of Persons with Disability. The disabilities is complicated, but it needs to be done. Um, it is very complicated to, to think business as, you, as usual while addressing the issue of implementing the CRPD in a phase like this. That comes right after the pandemic, and then during the war, uh, on the doorstep, uh, doorstep of Europe. It seems obvious to me that human rights can be, be, can be uh, made payable in, in times of peace. War and its economic consequences, inflation and cost, cost of energy, are taking the issue of, of disability down on, on one step further on the scale of importance. I live in a country where we just have attended, uh, as we all know, political elections. As never before, all parties have addressed the issue of rights of, and inclusion of persons with disabilities. Few of any uh, uh, have indicated the resources they could draw on to implement what they wrote in the program as opposed to tax cuts rather than improving pensions for the entire populations. population. So the signal is not positive in itself. We can only imagine what we've um, becoming after with the winter season, so this season, with an er energy crisis never seen before. I can see that I'm not, op uh, I can say that I'm not op optimistic at all, but uh, I don't see any debate on the horizon. So I think that this is uh, maybe the most important thing you're doing here. So raising up the issue and try to, uh, um, to make institution talk about uh, all this. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Berberi, for your time and also for uh, representing our host today. It's uh, great to know that in the heart of Brussels, uh, topics like that can also have uh, their space in, in physical and in metaphorical sense. Um, I would, uh, before uh, giving the floor to our next uh, opening panelist, I would like maybe just to debrief a bit on what uh, you mentioned regarding the importance of accessibility, regarding the importance of uh, doing, uh, solving this in, in partnerships as well. Uh, with the Ukrainian people uh, and having their word value and their their presence being valued as well, because I think that the example you gave for the uh, Ukrainian paraplegic is not uh, it's not acceptable for the year we live in. 
uh, when the war started uh, with the SPD, we got uh, in touch uh, with the headquarters of uh, humanitarian and social affairs of the president of Ukraine. And from the first week, we are in touch with uh, uh, a lot of people from the ministry, from the headquarters, from the civil society in order to see what is needed and what we can do uh, in all of that. So we do make uh, the topic of uh, uh, services and disability during the war a bit more visible because unfortunately there's not many events who look at this angle of the war and uh, you also mentioned refugees and i think that it's really important to keep on reminding i've said this sentence so many times but most of the ukrainian people are still in ukraine and they will be in ukraine so focusing and over focusing on refugee policies is uh, one of the things we can do but it's really not solving uh, the whole the whole uh, situation we have on our hands uh, having said all that, I would like now to give the floor to Tatiana Lomakina, which is the Commissioner of the President of Ukraine uh, for the Barrier-Free Environment. Uh, unfortunately, she's not uh, able to join us in person, but uh, she's kind enough to join us uh, online. Tatiana, uh, hello, nice, nice to see you. I'm glad that you have uh, uh, the opportunity to be with us today. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Dear participants in the meeting, Dear Maria Doniva, dear Petro Barbieri, as the Commissioner, very free Commissioner for the President of Ukraine, I'm very pleased uh, to be here with you and I welcome uh, greetings from Ukraine during the large scale invasion uh, of Russia to Ukraine. We understand the value of human rights, of lives of people with uh, a disability as never before. That helps us to go through extremely, extraordinarily hard times. That's the belief in Ukraine, the belief in Ukraine that we will rebuild together with the European and international partners. The belief that every human being has a value and we respect uh, variety and multiplicity. We uh, value this support during this hard situation and the great potential of the Ukrainian society is to be good, to be supporting, uh, supportive or respective and to be to assume responsibility for everything that's happening now and for what we can really impact and influence. The discussion topic for today is quite uh, difficult, quite uh, important and, and complex. Indeed, we raise it at the level of Ukraine during our negotiations with our international partners when we talk about the humanitarian response issues, because basic needs, food, immediate evacuation from the areas of hostility, zones of hostilities, we should do that. But also how we do it, how we move people, what conditions were set uh, up for them in the receiving communities, that issue requires our additional attention. Of course, we are aware, of course, of the fact that today, when we're thinking about in people with disabilities, not just as a human being who we should take care of, but we also think about them, that this person should be able to be independent, autonomous, and they should be heard. They should make, be able to make decisions about their everyday lives. And they should be able to study, to work, and they should be able to feel equal to others. And what follows fr flows from that is that we really need to pay attention to the issues related to how Ukraine is going to transition to the, the institu institutionalization. And that is linked to the issues of psychiatric clinics, uh, uh, hospitals, and psychoneurological uh, boarding institutions and we should be able to develop this to the extent that an individual would be able would no matter what disability would be able to look at any community this transition is not going to be easy now that ukraine is investing all the resources that it earns is investing first and foremost to defend in defending itself all the expenses and expenditures that we have with the social and humanitarian fields is basically the uh, expenses that we're able to cover uh, owing to the support of our international partners and all these forms that we're starting during the war will require three important components the ability for people to to implement this reform training the specialists and experts number two time we should calculate and 
have time for that. And number three, we will need additional resources for the implementation of all this and, and additional costs. And that is something that we're working on, working with the Minister of Social Policy, which leads this process. We need to build the concept, the system, the vision of the system that we would like to build for people with certain disabilities. Therefore, the subject matter today is quite important. I would like to thank you for the organ for organizing this event. To all the participants in this event, I would like to wish a lot of fruitful work. And I do hope that will become another step towards Ukraine starting an important movement towards creating a comfortable and correct conditions for to enable every person with disability in Ukraine to be able to feel free, dignified, independent. It's an ambitious goal and objective, but it's possible to be realized if we combine our efforts. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for uh, being with us today and for the strong message. Uh, I, When I was uh, thinking about the this event, I think that the key thing we need to have in mind and keep on repainting uh, is independence. Independence when it comes to Ukraine, independence when it comes to every citizen to choose the way that they want to live, independence to all people regardless of disability impairment uh, or, or economic situation before or during the war. Because independence and freedom are the two fundamental things that uh, stand behind everything else that we need to do. Uh, we cannot talk about quality of services without the freedom and without the independence. We cannot talk about the proper support of assisted living uh, without freedom and independence. So uh, again, Ms. Lomakina, thank you very much for uh, underlining that as well. Um, I would like, before I give the floor to and invite Miroluba uh, on the stage, the author of the documentary that uh, we are um, really excited to see today, I'd like maybe to go a bit uh, back uh, in the end of February when the war started and uh, just give a bit of a background to the people in the audience here today who are wondering uh, what is ESPD doing in that topic, because we're not a humanitarian organization. We represent services. We don't... Uh, the topic of peace is fundamentally important, but we don't work with it on a daily basis. Um, when the war started, uh, of course, we as people, I think as uh, professionals, were really concerned and uh, uh, we wanted to do something. But when I think uh, it all became also a professional topic is when uh, we saw how the policies regarding Ukraine and regarding the support are shaped, how the media attention regarding the topics and the policies regarding the, the crisis are shaped. And we didn't see a lot of uh, things re regarding disability or regarding people with disabilities uh, and regarding services and institutions. Uh, there were a few researchers and a few reports in the beginning mentioning really different numbers of people which are in institutions. Uh, there were reports which would say 50,000, 60,000, 100,000 people even. Uh, so this lack of clarity in the beginning was, I would say, our motivation to explore more, to work with local partners uh, as uh, Gerello, and I'm very glad that we have them here today, uh, and to start exploring a bit more on what exactly is the situation on the uh, on the spot and what we can do, because we know that services are essential part of a community and of a society, and if the society is in crisis, social services can be an essential part of, of the rebuilding process. But also they're the one, one of the first who takes the hit. And that was also seen in the border countries. A lot of the social services engaged into the first uh, response of supporting refugees, uh, not only with disabilities, uh, but refugees as a whole. And then that also led to a lot of uh, social services being on the urge of uh, losing resources and losing people due to burned out. So for us, this topic became important, uh, I would say from the first day as people, and maybe from the first week as professionals who were seeing how the topic is reflected in media and uh, in policymaking. Uh, this is the long answer to the question of why we are here today. 
the short answer to the question, I think, will come uh, in uh, maybe at the end of, of today after all of the discussions and the, the panels we have. Uh, but we also had um, the opportunity in September to share a really interesting week with Miroluba Banatva, and I'd like to invite her so we can tell you a bit more about that uh, now. Uh, you know, we... Um, Yes, maybe just an applause before we, we start with the next. <laughs> Thank you for, for being here, Miroluba. Um, we, in the ESPD board meeting, uh, we had a recommendation from a few board members that the way to raise more awareness about the topic of disability and services in the context of the war in Ukraine we need a visual product, we need a documentary, we need something that will show the problem because people, I would say not a lot of people read reports nowadays, not a lot of people read researches, they need to see something. And in our ESPD journey in finding the right uh, documentalist, journalist, reporter, uh, I approached Miroluba, who is an award-winning journalist from Bulgaria, and uh, she has done over 50 documentaries and uh, many, many thousands of uh, reportages on different topics, and she has very, really good background in disability. Uh, and uh, I'd like to give the floor now, just before the official panel starts and the questions, for you to present uh, the documentary and what, uh, what we did for this one week. Thank you, Maya. Huh. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I'm a crime reporter, so now I don't feel very well here. <laughs> but uh, so thank you, Maya, for uh, the opportunity to travel to Ukraine and to make the documentary there. So we've been on uh, in Lviv, in Ternopil, in uh, Mukachevo, in Ushgorod. So how many of you have been in Ukraine? There's a lot of Ukrainians. <laughs> Uha! So it it's interesting for me to to listen how after the documentary, what do you think about it? Because yeah, I'm Bulgarian. I have uh, some friends in Ukraine, but yeah. Uh, this film is uh, no longer no longer relevant today. We made it in on September. In September, yeah. In September, yeah. Uh, the places we visited uh, today are not calm. They were. Mm -hmm. but today they are not and the winter is hard but not for us mm -hmm. the the winter is hard for them and you know <sighs> so we've been in ukraine as you said uh, in the beginning of september in the western part part of ukraine and uh, we didn't uh, fail the war but in one of uh, the places we've visited, Ternopil, the director planned to recover the bomb shelter. Two weeks later, they had to use it because of the airstrikes over the all Ukraine. So, yeah, the film is uh, no longer relevant. Unfortunately, yeah. Is it unfortunately is not longer relevant because we wanted to show that even in the safest parts, the institutions and the war correlate, and it's not longer relevant because the war is already in these parts as well. Uh, even though I think the stories are still very relevant, and I'm very glad that also some of the people who are in the documentary are with us today. We have uh, Yulia and Mikola and uh, uh, Yulia's family is here with us. Uh, we have Gerelo's team who are also, we, we filmed in their uh, center. We have uh, three girls uh, from Mukachevo Internet, Varia, Lilia, and uh, Agata. So thank you for being with us as well. And some of the uh, staff member of, of the uh, internet. So I think that uh, without any further ado, we, we can just go towards uh, seeing the documentary and then we can have a short Q&A session with uh, Miroluba. 
Uh, I would like maybe just to ask uh, if we can, do we, we can start with the documentary now? Okay, so we'll go back to our seats and uh, then we'll be back for the Q&A session here. Okay, uh, I think that we are starting together from the very, the, the fastest coffee break I have seen in an event was that. So thank you for uh, having the, uh, yeah, the energy even before the coffee. Now with this next uh, uh, milestone of, of today, what we have to do is uh, dig a bit more into the topic of uh, the institutionalization uh, and services, disability and the war and how all, all of those uh, really huge topics correlate uh, and mix. Uh, I'd like to present our panelists. Uh, yeah, okay, so we'll solve it now uh, with the translation. Yes, okay. Uh, so with me uh, on uh, the panelist table today, we have, I will start from my left towards uh, uh, the end of the table. So we have uh, Miroluba Banatva, who is the author of the documentary, as I already presented her. Uh, we have uh, uh, Eric uh, Blumka. I, I can never say your, your family. And it's really, really uh, ironic because I have to present you in so many events. Blumkog. Yes, yes, yes. Blumkog. So uh, we have uh, Eric, uh, who has a lot of uh, background uh, in Ukraine uh, services and early childhood intervention services, especially. And uh, he's one of those specialists who actually used to work in Ukraine before the war. Uh, and has a lot to uh, share on that. We also have uh, Yulia with us. Uh, Yulia is uh, one of the people who we filmed in the documentary that you just saw. She's the mother of uh, Mikola, and uh, I think she's one of the bravest people I have personally met. So thank you for being with us on this table as well. Uh, with us is also Halina uh, Kuriwo, who is uh, from DR, DRI Advocacy uh, Association, working a lot on DI in Ukraine. And she's one of the experts that I met in my uh, search of people to talk with about guardianship. So thank you very much, Halina, for being with us today. And uh, last but not least, we also have uh, Varia, uh, Varvara Alibok, who is uh, a resident in the center, the Internat in Mokachevo, uh, and uh, she's with us today to share her story. And she's next to Yulia with one of the bravest people I've personally met. So thank you very much, Varia, for being with us today. Uh, we have a very strong panel. And I have very tough questions for them. Uh, and I would like to start with uh, Yulia, as uh, your story touched uh, all of us, I'm sure. And it was very impressive to hear what uh, you've been going through and uh, how you are uh, handling everything that life brings to you. So thank you very much for sharing this with us. I'd like to start maybe a bit uh, from uh, from with a retrospective question. When Mikola was born uh, and your family dynamic changed, I'm sure, what kind of support and advices did you receive in the beginning? Good day. My name is Yulia Botsun. I'm from the east of Ukraine, from Luhansk, oblast from Rubizhna town. On the 13th October, October 2012, during the premature birth, I gave birth to a son. The cerebral palsy was diagnosed at about one year old age. There were not that many friends and experts who would help me with that. So I had to deal with that myself alone. I read a lot. I went to visit doctors. I was looking for rehabilitologists. I wanted to have my, I wanted my child to live and to adapt, to socialize, to socialize. And unfortunately in 2014, the war started, which started in the east of Ukraine. Luhansk region was divided into two parts. Luhansk, the center, the city, where we had rehabilitation centers, neuropath neuropathologists were occupied. And therefore I, face the reality of I needed to find new ways, new opportunities to raise my child. Then I went to the city of Kharkiv, a big city, very progressive one, and there doctors started helping me. 
at least with some medication, because at that time in my town, I was not able to buy, to have access to medication. With the help of heart care doctors, I started to rehabilitate my child. Then we had an opportunity that arose that gave us an opportunity to go to the Hajibe Rehabilitation Center in Odessa region, the Center for Mothers and Children. That was one of my first trips. I saw a professional massage performed for the first time. I saw how professionals work with children there. I read literature. I'm a, I'm a teacher of, I'm a phys ed teacher. It was not a new thing to, for me, but it was specific uh, for my child. After that, I started going to the International Center for Volodymyr Kazyavkin, headed by Volodymyr Kazyavkin. They are great specialists, great professionals. And I saw first results how, how my child managed to unclench his hands at the age of three. So year after year, I was collecting all my savings and was bringing my child to the for the rehabilitation. I also spent a lot of time paying attention to have my child swim. We had a, a small swimming pool that we, it was a sort of an ex, that, that was a very small pool that we managed to sort of set up and the child swam there and feeling was feeling better. I worked at the school and with the help of the management of the school and the reforms that started, even though they were slow, but they were at least going some, some kind of reform along the path of reforms. And then the inclusive education notion was, was launched that these people, these children could actually attend school. The conditions were set, created for them to, to attend school. So we worked with teachers as much as we could, so we could create the conditions for my child to visit school to the extent, to the best possible extent. Three, uh, three children with cerebral palsy attended the school at that time, and because we need to do the architectural and other uh, conditions to them. So my child would visit this school two times a week so that she could socialize with her peers. Unfortunately, the war struck again and as Mariana said, we did not live right away. We hope that the armed forces of Ukraine will come and re liberate us and we will start restart living. Unfortunately, our hopes were dashed and they didn't come true. Unfortunately, my motherland is still occupied. And since I have an old mother, I had to, to decide how to leave this that hell. We lived for 12 days in the basement, my family and two neighbors, 16, 50 years old, they were, we tried to survive. It was horrible. It was scary. We feared for our children. And uh, I was afraid if I die, who will take care of them? I have a, a daughter, she's 21. She has to build her own life. And when we're having coffee here, you know, they were sitting there next to them, my daughter and, and his son, he was asleep and she was sitting next to him. And when, after that, we decided we have to go to the evac evacuation train to go to Lviv. It was hard, it was difficult because somebody was, people were trying to help you at the train station, but your consciousness does not, is not able, was not able to receive the situation, to, to understand the situation. It's like two lives broken together, that life and this life, how could that be put together? It was difficult with humanitarian uh, assistance first. I started looking for a job because I realized I can't really live off a humanitarian aid only. I have to do something myself. And I started looking for a job and I found it in a very good center of like-minded people, colleagues, good, great people. That was called Gerald Law Center. I was an working as an assistant. Now I am a supervisor and my child was I, I got my child to this center and she this attends this center every day and she is uh, there thank you very much i think that um, your your story is really remarkable and it shows not only your your journey from rubezna to lviv uh, but also the journey that 
the social system of Ukraine is making from uh, having more and more support and more and more attention. So not each parent has to fight for, for their uh, child uh, all the time. Uh, so it's really interesting to hear from you. And uh, again, thank you for, for being with us today. Um, I'd like to go to Halina now uh, and ask if you heard a bit more uh, if that's a story of a family. So the story, the story of a family where uh, the mother is the active uh, hero, the mother is the, the fighter. And unfortunately, that happens every time when there is no system. A lot of time, it's so just a message. If somebody clicks their mic, my mic is off. So, <laughs> and if, then that's why I keep on clicking. Yeah. Uh, and I think that our interpreters are getting small heart attacks every time this happens because they can't hear us. So, uh, the story of Yulia is the story of a family. But when the family is not there, what happens is that the system has to intervene. And sometimes the system is not shaped in the best way. Uh, when uh, we were meet with Miroluba in Ukraine, uh, I figured out that the situation with guardianship in Ukraine is really complicated and it's really uh, it's struggling for a lot of people to get out of the situation. And you had a lot of experience with guardianship. So I'd be really interesting if you could uh, uh, try to summarize for us what is guardianship in Ukraine? How does it work and what has been your experience with the topic so far? Thank you, Maya. I, I just first would like to say that I'm from Disability Rights International, the Ukraine program director, and DRI is a human rights organization. And we believe that the human rights uh, issue is uh, often overlooked or uh, paid not enough attention to in the uh, planning of system of services. And before, I'm happy to be here to give the voice to this problem, uh, which is much, much broader than standards of services and of uh, conditions in institutions. As for your words, my about uh, family, it's, it's, it was really touching to hear Yulia's story. And uh, they and um, her family has been through a lot. And she's always been a champion for her child. And this is how it uh, really happens when there is a child with disability in a family and the family refuses to uh, give it up to institution and to uh, receive services other than in the family and has to struggle to get uh, the support to fight for the support and you said that what if the family is not there and they have to uh, and the system has to intervene and my other rhetorical question why we have to uh, counterpose family and uh, system because the system can be a family-based system. If the family is not in place, a person with disability can be in a family-based alternative care. This is what is supposed to be a, a, not even a standard, but something that is not even discussed. A child has to be in the family. And it's, it's full stop. There is no other way to uh, provide uh, services in the best interest of the family. And um, so the guardianship, um, so when... Uh, so this problem, as I said, is much broader. It's about something uh, less tangible. It's about uh, human rights. And the whole institutional system of Ukraine is based on medical and rehabilitation model uh, rather than uh, a human rights model or rights-based. And that means that people from very um, early age, from birth, are equated with their symptom, with their disability. And that's when they end up in institution to receive services. What if the family is not in place? also uh, give, uh, leads us to another point. What if family is in place, but the system, uh, the services are not there in the community and they still have to uh, place their child into institution in order to receive services. And then once a child is in institution, once they enter this um, system, institutional system of care, they spend a life there. So the lifetime of institution, institutionalization uh, doesn't, help in maintaining their rights. So when it comes to guardianship, when children grow and they become adults and they're supposed to be adults, you know, adults make decisions. Sometimes the decisions have to be supported, but uh, in institutions, even if they maintain their legal capacity, they are still de facto deprived of legal capacity. They're deprived of ability to uh, make their own decisions. So imagine you're an adult, you're like a young woman and, um, 
like I cannot imagine myself not being able to choose uh, what I eat every day, where I go, when I go to bed, what I watch, with whom I live in one room. These are all things that are really basic to all of us. And uh, people who uh, started their life in um, their spent most of their life in institutions, they're deprived of this uh, basic human rights ability. And this all ties into guardianship. People with disabilities because of the system in Ukraine, and not only in Ukraine, uh, are usually, especially with intellectual disabilities, are deprived of legal capacity. They are deemed uh, unable to make their own decisions. Not only big important decisions like, um, I don't know, some kind of legal issues, but also like basic, basic decisions. When a person is in an institution, government of Ukraine, the state of Ukraine is its guardian, but de facto it's the director of the institution. And um, I've seen good directors and I've been visiting institutions in Ukraine in oblasts from Donetsk to uh, Zakarpatia. It was before 2014 even. And I've seen good directors, but I've never seen a good institution. Because its institution cannot be cannot be good. It cannot be compatible with human rights. So um, when the director is the guardian de facto, um, the if the person wants to, for example, wants to get out and want, wants the guardian uh, their legal capacity to be restored, to be able to make their own decisions, they have to go through court. Legal uh, capacity is restored through court. But if they go through court, they have to file an application. And they have no possibility, being deprived of legal capacity, they have no possibility to file an application, a complaint. So their guardian has to do it. So that means that translates into the director has to go and file a complaint, which is a vicious circle. And you, you understand that. It's What if the director is abusive? And we've seen directors like that. What if uh, residents are afraid of that? They cannot just come to the director and say, hey, can you help me with the court or... Uh, process and because I want my guardian and my capacity restored it's it's not even that even if the directors are not abusive they are not interested in having people out of institutions because then what if we have everybody out in in the community will be out of business and I don't mean that they make money on that I mean that we'll be out of institution it will be the end of this place and this is my workplace so we are in a system that keeps everybody in place and there are like safeguards that, in a bad sense of this word, that keep everybody in their places, in their roles, and this um, whole performance continues. Um. Okay, I think that that uh, puts a bit of a context for, for the beginning of the discussion. Uh, it is unfortunately a story that we've seen in many countries, not only in Eastern Europe, but also honestly everywhere in the world where there has been large uh, institutions before the system is reformed. Unfortunately, this is the, the situation for many people who live uh, in institutions like that. Um, I think it's fair now also to give the floor to somebody who has actually uh, spent uh, their life in an institution and it's fair to hear from uh, the first hand experience. Um, so we've met uh, with Varya in September uh, in Mokachevo while we were uh, filming and we had a very uh, funny conversation as, as a start and uh, I'm just interested to see uh, how she sees her life uh, in in the internet and what she would like to share about it. Of course, if there is something that you don't feel comfortable with sharing, please don't. But uh, I, I would be interested to to hear your your thoughts about it. Well, of course, I would like to leave the internet, the boarding school, and to leave my own life so that I wouldn't be under control and nobody would order and instruct me. I want to leave independent on my own. I'm, I'm already an adult. Um, I'm 33 year old. I want to live an independent life. I don't want to be dependent on anyone. So that's that's my point. What do you want? What do you see for yourself in the future? Well, if I will leave the internet, everything will be wonderful. 
na, na majbutnje. Any plans for the future? Come on, tell it. She is asking about your plans for the future. We can we can go back to 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 the question a bit later if you feel more comfortable in replying. But I think that's a very clear answer even for for the start. Um, I think that it's also talking about institutions and uh, the alternatives of institutions. We have one really uh, important system that should be in place in each country. And I know that uh, we have on this table somebody who have spent a lot of time trying to support the development of this process, uh, the early childhood intervention uh, system and process. So Eric, can you again uh, share a bit uh, of what you've been doing in Ukraine before and how uh, do you see the future of the reform forms that need to be done in Ukraine now. Yeah, thank you, Maya, for inviting me. Uh, this is really a topic uh, that, that, that fits in my, my experience in, in, in Ukraine, both institutions. You may not know a lot of my history there, but we actually I started um, in 2006 when there was a conference and, well, I, I, in, in Uskot, um, and I was invited to give a workshop on lobby and advocacy to NGO, NGOs, Ukrainian NGOs, on how to have more impact uh, on the policies on the, the local and regional level. And during that uh, conference, or part of the conference actually was a tour visiting some um, uh, services. And uh, I, in that tour, I visited the Girolo, and there or, uh, in Lviv, and there already started uh, the cooperation. So it's really long, history of uh, working together. Um, but I also visited a, a, ch a children's internat, as they are called in Ukraine, uh, for disabled children in uh, ivano frankivsk And um, I, I had the feeling that I was visiting hell, to be honest. Uh, m all my life I spent in development cooperation. I've been in many countries. In, uh, I lived in, in Ecuador. I, I spent a lot of time in slums and uh, in Darfur, in Sudan, and among refugees, and I've seen a lot of misery and problems in the world, but I never uh, cried during my work. And this was the first time I was crying because the situation was so desperate, so terrible of all these children that were lying in their beds with no activity, with uh, clearly uh, malnut uh, malnutrition, Mel, mel, they, are, they were malnourished, uh, no activities, nothing, nothing, just staring to the, the ceiling. And I thought, this can't be true. I've seen so many things, but this was really... So, um, but in that uh, uh, visit to Uskot, I also met, met Natalia Skripka, uh, then director of the National Assembly of People with Disability. And I met Irina Roshkovich, who was in the film. And we're still working together, uh, and I'm very lucky to have met them, because these were, at that time, they were much younger, <laughs> uh, 16 years ago, uh, very motivated to make a change. And that contrast of, you know, a service that was so terrible, and these uh, great uh, daycare centers started by parents at Girolo in, in, in Lviv and, and Path of Life. Uh, in, in, in Uskot and uh, a National Assembly of People with Disabilities with great contacts in Kiev, I thought, hey, this is a window of opportunities because there are great uh, grassroots examples, really community-based examples, and we might have, through the National Assembly, uh, access to policy-making process. So we really start to push there and uh, knock doors it was very difficult. And when there's one thing has changed in all those years in Ukraine is that now it is getting quite normal uh, that non-governmental organizations and governmental organizations work together. And I'm really pleased also to see representatives from the Department of Social Policy from Sakapatia. We have weekly meetings. Uh, we discuss uh, today, of course, the emergency, but that we have such a frequent meetings started because we have a memorandum of understanding about deinstitutionalization in Zakapatia. And so, and we have a long history of cooperating. Now, 
we we organized we thought okay i thought and 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 the ukrainian parties this is just this can't be true this horrible situation we have to do something what can we do well let's first of all improve situation inside the institution so we we but we had to have the agreement with the, the uh, ministry of social policy about that so so there was a whole lobby process to get that agreement there on that level that they would allow us at least to work in the internet so we needed to have some directors who wanted to pilot and we with all that we could arrange training in basic care for the nannies working in those institutions because situation is so bad because not they they're bad people but they are totally unskilled understaffed and underpaid as well so that was that became part of our lobby but we also trained them and in 15 different internats we provided basic care course in some eight we provided a follow-up training on communication we, uh, so to improve the relationship between the caregivers and the and and the, and, the, and the disabled children but from the beginning we had the the the, the idea this can't be the system we we have to do something to stop the system we have to prevent that the children get into the system and there we started with the idea already we discussed it in 2008 to start early childhood intervention in ukraine as a system of preventing of no of strengthening the family strengthening the the, the parents in their endeavor to to really be able to grow up the child within the family and hopefully also with support in 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 in, in their uh, society so with community-based services so and that became a big success in that time i asked my partners uh, this is such a big country i don't in that time i didn't know ukraine and isn't it already existing and yes there was one one early intervention center in kharkiv and and we immediately made contact and we invited them to come to lviv to Girolo, and we we started to build a training together with the experts from Girolo, from from kharkiv and from the netherlands we made a team to train new early intervention teams and from there it, the snowball started to roll and after a few years we had four kharkiv lviv uzgorod and odessa and these became really the central points of developing uh, early intervention and from there together we lobbied with the national assembly again uh in kiev we lobbied at unicef with the ministry of health ministry of education ministry of social policy um even with the then uh in the previous government with the uh, vice prime minister and so and we really got the support and now it is a, a national program and two weeks ago i received can you imagine during this war at the ministry of social policy together with the ngos by my, my counterparts they developed a, a full skill new regulations for the whole of the country with an ambitious plan plus budget for next year 20 new early intervention centers have to will be created i this is also ukraine this is during war and the early interventions keep on working i would like to to cut you on this suspenseful moment because i think it's a good uh, it's a good pause now to see the budget for next year and the, the scaling out of pci um of course if there are no other uh, parallel services and tools for uh, for support we end up with uh, just more and more people in institutions uh, and then if the society and if the institutions the authorities are not engaged into di it doesn't work only with the civil society pushing for it so it's good to see that there is a will from all sides in here um i'd like to go now to miroluba uh, and uh, try to draw uh, do you see any parallels actually between uh, what you've been doing regarding disability and di in bulgaria and what you stole in ukraine okay so i would i would translate she would speak to bulgarian i'll translate back <laughs> Yes, there are many there are many parallels, uh, mainly because both Ukraine and Bulgaria are part of the ex uh, uh, Eastern Bloc.
what really impressed me, and I think I already mentioned that, was that there was a director who was in charge and who was in his position for 40 years. Because through the story uh, and the background of this director, we can actually see the background and the story of institutions like that through communism and socialism to nowadays. During the uh, socialistic or communistic regimes, violence in institutions like that is the commonly accepted method of discipline. Nowadays, we don't really know, so we can only guess if violence has any space as a discipline approach in places like that. We don't know. If I have to answer based on my experience in Bulgaria and what I've seen, I can say yes, most of the times violence is there and it is used as a method of disciplining in these places. Another important thing which we have to mention while talking about human rights and about the uh, attitude of people who work in institutions. And again, I will use an example which is regarding the fact that Bulgaria has been an EU member since 200, uh, 2009. And seven, <laughs> sorry, 2007. <laughs> Bulgaria has already closed all of the institutions for children aged zero to three. And there has been many, there has been many reforms, mainly targeting children, uh, really young children. If you take a look uh, on paper, there are so many different types of services, again, mainly targeting at children. Um, but when it comes to adults with uh, intellectual disabilities, institutions uh, such as the one we saw still exist, and they're really far away uh, in uh, rural areas, uh, villages which are isolated. A lot of the institutions that I've seen in Bulgaria, again, a member of the EU, still look far worse than what I saw in Ukraine now. The main challenge that Ukraine has to overcome is that closing this institution also addresses the fact that a lot of the staff members are employed. So the, the employment of the region actually correlates with the staff members being in that region as well. So even if those uh, institutions don't exist and there are new services, the people who work, work there are most likely the same people who will be lacking the same skills as Eric mentioned and there are not even enough people on that. So yes, there are many parallels that I can see and unfortunately I know how difficult it is what it needs to be done in Ukraine.
смяната на начина на мислене е нещо, което не е толкова лесно и не става с копче и не става на хартия. The change uh, that is needed, the mind shift that is needed is not a button that you can just press and that it happens magically. And um, yeah, it's not, it's, it's on paper, but it doesn't magically happen. Um, okay, I would like now, knowing that we have an next panel starting uh, in five minutes, just uh, ask from each of our speakers if you can have one sentence which would be your key message to the audience today. Uh, uh, if there is anything that you wanted to say and you didn't have a chance in your first intervention, uh, maybe we can start uh, from Halina and then uh, Varya, if again you want to share something, you're welcome to do that. Um, just one key message. One key message yeah. I guess the biggest message is that, um, as Zoroslava said, that uh, reform in a there's never a good time for reform. There's always some kind of war or COVID or something. I would say that it's high time. It's a window of opportunity. It's it's high time we started the process, which is complicated and long, because the lives of people in institutions cannot be put on pause while we are dealing with more urgent issues as they usually say this was a great example of a short key message thank you very much varia do you want to uh, share with us any anything well i I want. I don't want to court in Mukachevo, but uh, but uh, but in here, not in Ujhorod, not in Svalava. I want a court in here. I don't want there because everyone is bribed in there in in Ujhorod, in Svalava. All those prosecutors, all those uh, 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 judges, they want. They don't want. They will won't believe me. This Gal Galina, this Gala, she's helping us probably not accessible to people in institutions uh, in Ukraine. That's why something independent is needed. Thank you very much. Uh, well, again, when we started, I said that the key message for today is freedom and independence, and that concerns Ukraine as a state and each single person in Ukraine as well. Uh, Yulia, do you have a, a key message for us as well? Well, as the mother of a child, I just want that your experience, that you've already passed that, because every country has its own path. Every country has made its own mistakes, made these lessons learned and took all the best. So I want this best experience to be finally, to, to finally reach Ukraine so that we, the parents and the relatives of uh, uh, of people like that could be using this experience so that we would have reforms in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much. I can assure that all of the ESPD's family and all of the 20,000 organizations and all of the thousands of specialists we have are ready to support you in that process. And thank you for, for that. Uh, Eric, I'm afraid you, you never have a short message, so I'm really afraid to <laughs> and also you're taking my mic even from now so please can you try to summarize a key message of uh, what do you think needs to be uh, the next step only the next step that the uh, eu and other big players i already mentioned it but i want to repeat it that in all reconstruction programs that are now already in process of elaboration and some are even uh, implemented in, in sense of reconstruction, that they should be inclusive, that uh, people with disabilities uh, will not be just uh, the um, re recipients of any of the services, but they, they are involved in this whole process, that they have a say in what, what should be done in Ukraine. Because big country, big differences between regions, big differences between NGO service providers, state service providers, NGOs, uh, disability NGOs and parents organizations and disability organizations should be in, absolutely involved in, in formulating the, the plans and in implementing and in monitoring. 
shared decision making and working together. That's the key message. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, but I think it was great. Uh, okay, and last but not least, Mira, do you have a key message after this uh, rich discussion? Надявам се в Украина да се получи по-добре, отколкото в България, въпреки войната, и разбира се, се надявам войната да приключи скоро. I hope that uh, the results you have in Ukraine will be better than the one we had in Bulgaria, and I hope that the war is over soon. Uh, okay, I would not have a key message because we're already very late, and I will use the opportunity with my closing remarks after the next panel. So thank you very much for our panelists, and I would like now to give the floor to uh, Tom Thomas Bignell from our policy team to chair the next part of this uh, event. Thank you. Hello, everybody. May I ask uh, Ms. Tokalieva to uh, come to the floor? Uh, also, Ms. Uh, Heraj Simchuk, I hope I'm saying it more or less correctly. And also, uh, Ms. Norton, Catherine, if you could come uh, up, that would be great. Thank you. So um, thank you, um, everyone. Um, so we heard a bit from those who are affected by deinstitutionalization, on the ground people, families, people who live in institutions uh, and so forth in, in the last panel. Uh, and now we will talk a bit more about uh, policymakers and how to make the change really uh, structurally. Um, I've done a lot of panels around deinstitutionalization, um, but I've never done one which has made me think as much as this one because I think everyone here agrees that deinstitutionalization is the way forward. But to talk about DI during a war is a completely different topic in some ways, not making it less important, maybe even making it more important, but it is extremely difficult. How can you judge? How can you criticize? How can you have say something about people who are being bombed every day and asking them, how can you transform what you're doing to community-based services? It's very tough. It's very difficult. Does that mean we should not talk about it? No. We need to talk about it, but I think we need to be extremely sensitive to the realities of the policymakers, the realities of the people who work on the ground to recognize that it's also extremely complex in terms of war, but we need to do it. We need to do it for people who live in institutions to get them out of institutions. And we also need to look into the staff and those who are working on the ground because they're often doing a very difficult job uh, and so forth. So I just wanted to say that, recognize that it's extremely difficult, maybe even more difficult than usual um, before uh, talking to policymakers because it's it's not easy for policymakers also, uh, especially in times of, of war. Um, so that being said, I will then, uh, we have, really the right people uh, at the table here. So I'd like to thank everyone for being here. We have Ms. Yuliana Tukalieva, who is uh, here, who's Deputy Minister of Social Policy of Ukraine. We have Ms. Dalia Herasinchuk, who is also here, who is advisor and commissioner to the uh, President of Ukraine on child's rights and uh, children rehabilitation. And last but not least, we have a famous face here in Brussels, Catherine Norta, Norton, who is director of the European Disability Forum. We have around half an hour to say quite a lot, so let's let's get down to it. I will start with Ms. Tukalieva. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, deinstitutionalization uh, before the war, during the war. We've heard, I think, from Eric, interesting things happening. Can you tell us a bit about where you are right now in terms of deinstitutionalization? Дякую. Я всіх вітаю. Ми вже з колегами в Брюсселі. I've I've been talking to colleagues uh, for three days already, and we've uh, talked all the three days about deinstitutionalization, about all those issues, about the interests of children and adults. And surely this conversation didn't start three days ago. In fact, it continues for many years. And uh, it is a very important conversation for Ukraine. And uh, it's further evidenced by the fact that uh, under the patronage of the First Lady of Ukraine, there was uh, this strategy for 
uh, the lack of barriers introduced in 2021. And at the national level, we had an agreement that not a single person should have any barriers uh, in, in its life, no barriers for her ability to talk, to move, or to, to work, to, to leave, basically. And already today, we've heard from Eric that we have uh, some results in early intervention, and these results are very inspiring. We have some changes in uh, the state building standards in order uh, for the people would be easier to move around the streets so that the buildings would be more accessible for people with disabilities. So we have certain achievements in social services area. And this is something that was already mentioned today after the movie, after this uh, documentary that uh, some those uh, um, institutions, they're currently being changed in order to support the families so that they wouldn't be, you know, an area where the, where the children are kept uh, and locked, but in cooperation with the families. I've uh, had this position a uh, few months ago, so my background is the, in human rights protection uh, field. So I know the challenges in this area. And today we've heard this a very good statement that we have to use this war as uh, kind of a possibility for introducing positive changes. I mean, since we do have this situation already, then why not using that situation? If we already have the destruction or the damage being caused, physical damage being caused to these certain institutions, then why not at a stage of rebuilding of those uh, institutions? Why not thinking that instead of just repairing those institutions, but how to use these resources to offer some services for the family so that the family would not even think of, uh, you know, abandoning their child because there is uh, special care uh, services, uh, early intervention services, rehabilitation services that truly helps the child. So that's the big priority that uh, we uh, in the Ministry of Social Policy have for ourselves. And this, this priority is supported by the Prime Minister, by the President of Ukraine. So it's, it's very important for us. And we already think of how to buy social services, procure social services, in fact, because in Ukraine, we had this large and very important reform of decentralization. We have to take that into account because many communities are now taking decisions on their own in terms of uh, the structure for medical support system, social support system. So there's non-governmental organizations like Jerry Law and some others. This is an example of communities taking the decisions on themselves and find and funding those organizations by themselves. So we gave them not only the possibility to take decisions, but also to collect taxes to support those decisions. So I definitely agree that it is the state that has to pass the laws, has to create the conditions when those services could be provided. And uh, I have a small statistics uh, that I would like to share with you. And someone asked how many kids and adults with disabilities do we have in different institutions? And in fact, there's a lot in uh, uh, internets and boarding schools, that's for the children with disabilities, we have over 4,000 children. So that's all, not only children without parents, it could be children with parents, but the parents are taking decisions to, to abandon their children because there is no services. And, and whenever we're talking about the rebuilding of the country, we have to understand that those resources has to be targeted to these major most important things like the establishment of services through the local authorities or through the public authorities. But there has to be a consistent system. And several thousand uh, adults are currently uh, located in the psychological and neurological uh, boarding schools. So we started uh, analyzing whether these people have their own uh, house or accommodation or education, whether they have relatives that could be able to take care of them because the situation might be different. And our task is to make sure that we support the families so that uh, they would 
take care or rather support people who could return from those internets or boarding schools to their homes. So uh, over these three days, we've heard a lot of experience from Romania, Bulgaria, and some other neighboring countries that we've seen that that was a long process. It was a complicated one, but still, it was a process that gave results. Then, and therefore, we can be inspired with these results and take uh, take into account what go what went wrong, and then take all the best uh, that was ever achieved. So I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to talk, to have some uh, advices from experts, to get some additional resources allocated for this reform. I'm very grateful to our colleagues from state and non-state institutions that we can talk about this in a, in a calm and fruitful manner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Tokarieva. I mean, I think many EU countries can be, I think, inspired from what's happening in Ukraine at the moment around um, ECI support for early childhood intervention, making sure that we stop children going into institutions at the youngest age possible. Uh, that's an issue around Europe, probably around the world. Uh, and, and so um, that's important to hear. The details, I'm sure, uh, are more for longer discussions, but uh, that's a very important step. So thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, now I will uh, pass the floor to Ms. Hila Simchuk, um, who uh, advises uh, the President of Ukraine on children's rights. Um, what is your role with regard to deinstitutionalization and what are your views uh, on this topic at the moment? Thank you for the possibility to, well, to deliver several messages. I believe that we cannot have a general overview approach to the issue of children, but I'll try to make sure that my statement is done within the time available. So surely you would hardly find a person uh, against deinstitutionalization, or that it's not high time to, to do that. So you won't be able people like that, particularly among the delegation of Ukraine. I'm a mother of a child with disability, so I can tell you for sure what I have faced as a mother 12 years ago when I learned about the diagnosis of my, uh, my daughter at the age of two. So we haven't received a service uh, of uh, early intervention and contact that, that we needed at that point. We haven't received uh, time the medical services. We didn't have a chance to uh, do some implants for uh, my daughter because she can't hear anything. She's deaf for the public funds. But whenever you're asking about my role in this deinstitutionalization, I would say that over the past 10 years, I was working uh, in, uh, in the field of advocacy for creating the services, for creating social, medical, and then educational services. And today, I can tell you that if my daughter would be born now, then I would receive formal services and my family would get more services. Yes, we've lost a lot of time, indeed. Uh, our family broke apart at that moment and there were a lot of barriers and we had to sell our property in order to do the surgery operation for our child. But now after 10 years, I can see the results of my work, the results of the work of our advocacy, because today uh, my daughter would get a screening for free at the um, hospital and she would be able to get uh, uh, special hearing devices for free from the public. Now she would be able to get uh, uh, medical consultations, medical advices. She would be receiving social services on rehabilitation. So that's, you know, a long path, those, all those 10 years, but still there are results. And I know what we are working for. So I can tell you that over the past year, because uh, uh, I've been appointed to this position uh, of uh, Commissioner of the President of Ukraine on Child's Rights and Children Rehabilitation uh, a year and a half ago. So despite all those barriers and challenges that we faced and we overcome with my family, 
Uh, but still, over the past year, it was extremely difficult because now it's all about differing challenges, far greater responsibility. And the only thing I can object is that the reform of deinstitutionalization is not being paused in Ukraine. It's moving. It, well, it's uh, sort of uh, too decelerated, but still, we know where the country would need to work further on, we are not um, removing our responsibility or trying to put the responsibility on others. We uh, clearly understand that an experience like that is something that is unique to Ukraine. We wouldn't like to have it, but we still will, will have this ex experience. We continue this reform. We do everything necessary in order to have uh, the screening uh, for certain diseases. And uh, we can already say that now during the war, we've established a very unique centers under the program of the president of Ukraine. There is uh, a special screening for 24 genetic diseases. So on, even now we can identify the disease in a timely manner. We're currently working on the establishment of a protocol for reporting the diagnosis so that it would be done in a proper manner so that the mother and the father would not be frightened uh, about this first news because surely uh, everyone felt this moment because uh, I mean they felt trembling and because everyone returns uh, uh, to the time when they've heard the diagnosis for their child for the first time. So. Uh, in addition to the implementation or rather for the scaling up of the early intervention services around the territory of Ukraine, we're also implementing the uh, services for uh, catamnastic uh, accompanying uh, services. And we uh, further scale up our capacity step by step. Uh, that's all related to social services so that every child would have a family. And that's the that's the objective. That's the goal. The objective I was, uh, I have received from the president. It was very ambitious task, but I heard this. So he said that every child should have a family and has to live in a family and receive everything necessary for that. And I do hope that uh, the whole world is ready to support us because I, I've never been shy about being Ukrainian, but now I'm, I'm proud to say that I'm Ukrainian, that I'm from Ukraine, because my nation, my people are unique, because we are fighting for the democracy for the whole world, and we need just more, more support than, than in ordinary times. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Hera and Simchuk. Um, I think it's clear that we have uh, the right people in terms of values in the right places uh, in Ukraine in such a critical uh, time. There's a lot of attention going towards supporting children. That's the right approach for sure. Um, and then, of course, we, we can't forget also at the same time the many adults who continue to live in institutions. And, and we also need to, to, to find solutions for them uh, too uh, at the same time, which I'm sure uh, we, we are all looking at uh, as well. Um, Catherine, as director of the European Disability Forum, you work a lot on these issues. You work a lot with the European Union. Um, what this is, you know, as we know, social policy is primarily a national competence. It's national authorities who deal with it. But what can the EU do to support uh, the Ukrainian authorities in their deinstitutionalization uh, processes? Thank you very much, Tom. Can everyone hear me? Um, so thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this event today. Uh, I feel a bit humbled following the last two speakers, so we're honoured to have the Deputy Minister here, Ulyana Tokarieva, who has, despite the war situation in her country, talked about building back better. I don't know if we would all be as brave. She's talked about adopting laws and targeting resources to community-based services, including early childhood intervention, which we all know helps to prevent institutionalization and the presidential advisor Daria Harasimchuk has also pointed out that everyone agrees on the need for deinstitutionalization but she also pointed out the advances that have happened in Ukraine in recent years based on her own experience as well and the continued commitment to deinstitutionalization summarizing it in that every child should live in a family 
And I would like to focus on the EU's role because I think that the EU can and should play a role in supporting this, uh, Tom. So we've heard all afternoon that children with disabilities in Ukraine, as everywhere, should have the right to childhood, a family life, and ultimately the right to grow up and live independently and be included in the community. We know that Ukraine is committed to this uh, with the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The EU is also committed to this and all of its member states. Before the war, we know Ukraine had already a very high rate of institutionalization of children. And we know children with disabilities in institutions are more likely to experience restraint and ne neglect in environments like these. Children with high support needs in institutions are at high risk of preventable mortality, especially considering this winter. So what can the EU do? EDF and its members throughout Europe strongly condemn the war perpetrated by Russia on Ukraine. And we ask the EU to take every measure possible to bring the war to an end. This is obviously the thing that can help Ukraine most is that you have peace in your country. As winter sets in, the EU and member states need to reinforce humanitarian support with a clear focus on persons with disabilities and their families, on children with disabilities, whether they're in institutions or in their homes with their families, whether they're displaced in Ukraine or in Europe. We cannot forget those people with disabilities, children and adults still in institutions. They need safety, warmth, food. They need humanitarian assistance. And this is a role that the EU can play. The EU funds itself humanitarian assistance. So it's not the domestic social policy of the EU, but it is their humanitarian obligation. Throughout the coming years, the EU candidacy process. So by the way, to everyone in Ukraine today, welcome to the European Union because you're on the path to EU membership. And this was declared by the EU in June. And this process, the EU can support the creation of effective deinstitutionalization strategy. It can and it should. The long-term planning of and establishment of community support services. I say establishment, but we already heard today the good examples of community services and inclusive education, for example, which already exist. These services should be invested in and built upon. Without community services and support, independent living in the community is very hard to achieve. We heard today of families being pushed to institutional care as it was the only way to have services. This should not happen and the EU can play a role. The EU can lead in ensuring all reconstruction in Ukraine is accessible and inclusive. This was already referred to by the Deputy Minister uh, before me by both prohibiting rebuilding of se segregated institutions, but also ensuring that all public reconstruction is accessible. Every creche, every school, every city hall, every transport hub. Unless the place is accessible, it's very hard for people to be included in the community. All of this will be most effective if civil society organizations, community service providers, and most importantly, organizations of persons with disabilities and family associations are supported, strengthened, and included both now in the humanitarian process, right now targeting people with disabilities, but also in the long-term reconstruction of the country and the path to EU membership. The EU can continue and strengthen temporary protection for Ukrainians who are outside of Ukraine. We know that the temporary protection will be extended beyond uh, March, but it should be extended for as long as needed until people can return safely. And ensure that the Ukrainians amongst us here in Europe, uh, the children with disabilities, with family members with disabilities can live here in peace and be included. And this also requires EU investment. In particular, please remember as winter approaches, the children with disabilities with high support needs who should be receiving, receiving individualized supports. These children are in Ukraine and in Europe, and those in Ukraine with the high support needs have been left behind. We know this from, from speeches from our Ukrainian colleagues this week, that the EU and its member states have not done enough to ensure safe and secure evacuation of children who need, um, who need to be evacuated. So this is also something that the EU can do. These issues were recently highlighted by the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the Rights of the Child in their concluding observations, recommendations and joint statement. The, lastly, the priority for deinstitutionalization and the protection of children's best interests in Ukraine was also emphasized during the process of Ukraine's membership application to the EU. In its report on Ukraine's EU membership in June this year, and I read directly from the communication of the European Commission, Likewise, the support for persons with disabilities, which is according to the Commission's 
figures here, approximately 6% of the population, remains under-resourced and a deinstitutionalization process needs to be implemented tr to transition towards community-based care of persons with disabilities. I want to say I'm struck, um, Varvara, by your statement today on your right to decide for yourself and to make your own choices in your life. And this should also be included in reform processes. It's a core part of the CRPD and very important for independent living that people can make their own choice. So um, the token man on the panel here, Tom has just told me I have one minute, which is good because in Brussels, we always have to have gender balance panels. So when they find ESPD that they only have women, they had to assign Tom to us here. So he'd make up the balance. Um, I'd like to thank ESPD for organizing this event, but also for the continuous engagement that your organization and all your members have had since February 24th. I would also like to thank all of our partners, the staff here today and representatives from Ukraine who've been working hard to ensure the rights of children and adults with disabilities before and since this war started. I hope we can continue to collaborate and to be partners now and in the peaceful future. I hope you can soon enjoy. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. I think a message that ESB can fully support across the board uh, by and large, and, and we're looking forward to, I think, working together uh, as well as with our Ukrainian uh, friends to uh, to make sure that the EU's response in rebuilding um, Ukraine, helping Ukraine to rebuild, uh, goes in the, in, in the right way, in the right way of uh, human rights. Um, we're a bit behind schedule. I know that my colleague to the left have, has to leave, but maybe we can extend by a little bit. Um, but before, because I know that Daria has to leave, maybe um, five minutes. Okay. Well, I have a then a, a question for actually. Maybe are there any questions to the from the general public, in particular to Daria, who has to go to the parliament soon? I have plenty of questions, but they're not going to be as good as yours. So please. It's the end of the day. It's the end of the day. People need their coffee or their beers by now, maybe beers or in Belgium. Um, I have a, then a question, Daria. Um, we've talked a lot about Ukraine today. Uh, we haven't talked much about international support for your efforts. Are you in touch with international organizations and the EU uh, in terms of supporting what you're trying to do in Ukraine? If we are to talk about the deinstitutionalization today, we have to understand that we first have to analyze what we have done wrong when we started doing it. We have to do it st a step by step analysis what went wrong. We have to get new experience, new knowledge. What must be done? What should be done step by step we have to set up a new to create a new plan then we would like to get a financial support from our friends and naturally we'd have to plan have to plan a domestic information campaign significantly in order to implement the institutionalization reform in ukraine i am convinced that Ukraine does not need an external pressure in this regard. Ukraine is totally prepared and has political will to conduct and implement this reform, which is, and now is the most appropriate time to do it. We are prepared for that, for sure. But is the European Union prepared to support us in our readiness to do that? Are they at the EU ready to help us and support us in this complex time, difficult time, is one thing to implement the reforms in the pe under peaceful conditions. Another thing is when you have your screen, when you have a condition like we don't have lights or communication or heat, missiles are flying around here, we just see screens flickering. In our case, we have uh, all these conditions in Ukraine. No lights, no electricity, no heat, missiles flying, and we have to get together, get all the ministries and agencies together because we don't have a single ministry that deals exclusively with the issues of children and families. These tasks are vested with a, a number of ministries that have 
all these tasks to perform and we have to build bridges with all these ministries we have to combine all our efforts despite all the difficulties of times that we're living through and with the support of our friends and partners we could implement uh what we have thought ukrainians we are an incredible nation but nation but without partners and friends we won't be able to make it to implement therefore that's i'm talking about money here Thank you. I think a, a clear message, a clear message there, and it, it also looks like, um, I, I mean, the, the 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 expertise is is not just a one way. I mean, we heard that from Zirelo and, and others. There's a huge amount of expertise in Ukraine making the right reforms regarding ECI that the rest of Europe can also learn from and deal with as well. So I think we need to to explore how together we can build uh, early intervention uh, centers, how we can avoid institutionalization across uh, Europe, together, uh, the EU and Ukraine and others uh, in that way too, um, not just a one way financial support for, for Ukraine, um, because we have a lot to learn uh, as well. Thank you for joining us. I know you have to leave and uh, see you uh, see you soon. Um, now I have a maybe a similar question for you, Ms. Hera Simshuk. Um, uh, sorry, um, Mr. Karayevia, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, do you agree with uh, Ms. Hera Simchuk uh, here around uh, support from the EU? But, but maybe looking more at international institutions, uh, UNICEF, for example, uh, are doing a lot. Uh, Handicap International maybe are involved. Uh, what message do you have for, for these international uh, organizations, humanitarian organizations to help you? Do you have any, any messages for, for these types of organizations? I would like to get back to Barbara, who said a good thing, that she wants to live independently. And I'd like to take a look at these 28,000 people who are now residents at psychiatric neurological interna uh, internats or uh, in Ukraine who want to live independently. But undoubtedly, all these people have very different capabilities of living independently. Somebody needs more support, somebody needs more less support, but the support is important. We're now actively working to set up this system, not even to set it up, because we've already got quite, we've got quite a number of components in this for the independent living in Ukraine. We have to augment it, we have to enhance it to make sure that for each of these 28,000 individuals, so each of them would have an opportunity to live independently, or if it's not possible, if it were not possible, then they would be supported to the fullest extent. It's a support that would be human rights based kind of support so that their human rights uh, would be adhered to and observed. This is the first thing that I'd like to draw everyone's attention to. If these 28,000 could be distributed along the communities in Ukraine, perhaps it's not a huge number of people, but still, it's an important project that we need to implement. The next one is undoubtedly social services that need to be implemented at the community level. For example, we have only three and a half thousand of case managers, social work experts in the entire country. They take care of millions of families on a daily basis. These families are different they have a they live in difficult conditions bring up children with uh, uh, with disabilities and this this number of experts is not sufficient and so we talk we talk about unicef with regard to supporting these experts providing us to resources because they're not enough of them and we as the ministry in charge of children and families and people with disabilities and social services and payments and people, uh, old age people. We are prepared to manage these huge projects, provide administration support for these projects so we could direct costs to the communities so we'll have more experts of this kind, so we can have more services available for the families. We're doing already that. We're doing that already through humanitarian organizations that direct financial support programs financial support program 
to communities and they paid IDPs who live in various regions of Ukraine. We do have an experience working with these services, uh, providing us administrative support for that. Also, an important thing for us is to make sure that children, those children who are now uh, living with foster families, to make sure that we'll have more children of that kind, more have, would have more families of that kind. And we're talking now about the programs of building homes for such families in communities so that communities would have it, it would be it would be easier for the communities to set up these foster families and places where they could live so these steps could be numerous we clearly understand how and where we should go along this path and undoubtedly in addition to the financial support that that daria mentioned about we're talking about big learning programs we understand that psychiatric neurological residential homes we would not be able to shut them uh, to close them in a matter of days or, or, or we based on the experience from other countries it should be gradual we should not hurt and harm or harm anyone the society should be prepared to accept the residents of this residential home. And it needs also training. It needs experience to, to make sure they work within the framework of human rights to help those people who cannot live fully independently. So to, to, we have to make sure that there are services av available for those people who cannot be fully independent, independent. In Belgium, I saw these spaces uh, at psychiatric institutions as well. They are open spaces totally, and this is doable, I, I saw that here. So therefore we cooperate very closely with the Ministry of Health, uh, with any many other uh, government institutions and NGOs to implement this. So therefore training, expert support, recommendations, a possibility or not to support social service providers, not only those that are created and set up by the municipalities, but also by the civil society, the private sector. All these are the priorities that we're working on currently. Thank you very much, Mr. Dukarieva. Um, are there any questions from the public? I, I see a question over over here. I, I see the tie more than the person, the very um, colourful tie. Uh, Jim, you have a question? Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a remark, really. I, I would like to make. Uh, first, uh, Deputy Minister, that we will come to the conclusions shortly, uh, no, in, no doubt, or too soon, no doubt. But we would like to thank you, Deputy Minister, for uh, making the commitment to being here with us today, given the many demands on your time, particularly at the moment. So thank you. This is uh, Jim Crow, the president of ESPD. Uh, my observation is that I have rarely heard uh, uh, a government minister in any country make such a determined commitment uh, to turning off the tap of deinstitutionalization and creating uh, a pattern of family-based services for children with disabilities. So I thank you for that. Uh, I'm surprised, but perhaps given the t determination that your government and your nation has shown uh, since February uh, with regard to the war, uh, perhaps I shouldn't be surprised uh, given uh, that if you could bring similar drive uh, to DI, I'm sure it will happen. Um, so that was my, my comment. I think uh, in terms of concrete steps, uh, I very much uh, uh, welcomed proposals made by uh, Catherine Norton from EDF. Uh, that to me sounded like an, an ideal set of steps uh, that should be uh, asked of the European Commission. And I'm sure the SPD board would be very happy to uh, make common cause with EDF uh, should you wish to, uh, should you be in a position to take forward those uh, th those requests, because I think they are all eminently within the remit of uh, the Commission and within the uh, current funding 
uh, options that they have available to them. So I'm sure we could commit you to that. And I'm sure uh, Maya will take that forward with EDF. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, any other comments, uh, the lady in the front? Good day, Olena Vihor. My name is. I'm the representative of the Human Rights Commissioner of the Ukrainian Parliament here. And the a question, a rather a follow-up on my colleagues' comments. We've been talking about the deinstitutionalization for three days, actually. And I'd like to demonstrate real first steps. Five years ago, and I've been working in this social welfare and protection of the population for, for more, than, more than 20 years. For the first time, I saw a resident of this residential boarding home who was participating at, in the event of such a high level European event. And the fact that this this lady is with us here. It's the first bell ringing for the de DI reform in Ukraine. But I would like, and we, by the way, we know what we have to work on. When Barbara was asked, what are your plans? She had only one plan to leave the boarding home, the residential home institution. Now I understand we have to work on the plans. We have to have following questions get a job, get a profession, get your own place of home, set up a home and uh, to work successfully in a peaceful, successful Ukraine. This is the plan which we should work with them on. Thank you. Thank no, you. Thank, thank you, uh, Varvara. Thank you uh, on behalf of everyone uh, here, I think, for what is the the clearest message today is that uh, no one should live in institutions uh, anywhere uh, and we need to make concrete steps uh, as difficult as it is to concrete steps to 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 make that happen um i will now conclude uh, my part but i first want to thank the the speakers if we can applaud uh, everyone for being here thank you and then i will pass the floor uh, to maya doneva for some concluding uh, remarks Thank you. Thank you, Tom, uh, for the interesting discussion. It has been really professionally challenging and emotionally draining to follow everything that's been happening since 24th of February for me personally. And I, I'm, I'm glad that we can have this event and we can have this in-depth discussion and not just a shallow presentation, a picture and a goodbye. Because it's us, our responsibility as people, as citizens, as professionals to be involved in that topic in depth and to try to make an an effort to change and to influence the processes that we disagree in society. And I think that us being here, first of all, shows that we disagree with what's been happening uh, in Ukraine, uh, thanks to the Russian Federation's attack, that we disagree with what's been happening uh, as people and as professionals. And I'm putting this to dimensions because I think it's really difficult exactly in this case to say this is only work or this is only my my personal attitudes towards it and i think that for for all of us it's been really an honor to have so many people from ukraine to participate today so thank you very much for that first of all uh i'd like to thank uh, our interpreters who made this all possible uh thank you very much you're always this invisible force of nature that uh, makes all the events smooth all of the technical assistance we have from our great hosts in the economic and social uh, committee i'd like to thank very much all of the speakers uh and of course the author of the documentary miroluba which i I'm currently losing. Okay, I saw you. Thank you very much, Miro Lubo, for your work, for your dedication, and for your trust, because uh, it is a privilege to work with uh, journalists who understand the topic. You are a rare 
uh, gem in in the media field. So thank you very much for trusting in us to work with that, uh, with us on that. Uh, I'd like to really thank all of the speakers today. Again, uh, I know that I did it already for my panel. Tom did it for his panel, but it's been really interesting to hear everything that you've said. I'm pretty sure that you know there are events where panelists say some things and you're not even sure what they said at the end of the day you're not sure what is the the thing that is left with you and I think that from today's two panel we have so many food for thought after that so thank you very much to each of you for thinking for shaping what you need to say for saying it in the way that you said it and for uh, contributing to this discussion I'd like to say thanks as well to all of the partners and members of ESPD uh, in border countries and in Ukraine, because what we're doing as ESPD is only possible uh, through the individual strength and work of all of our partners and members. So thank you very much for working on that. And last but not least, I'd like to thank our board for uh, pushing to make this documentary and our team for bearing with me to push them to work on on them all the time and uh, that it didn't really feel like a push because all of us see that we have a role in all of that and uh, it's our responsibility as uh, an organization to work on that topic so there's so, so many things but yes uh if i have to just summarize um as that's the role of a concluding remark generally that's what i should be doing now we have a lot of work. That is what I put in my notes. <laughs> the concluding remark of today is we have a lot of work. Uh, we need to find a lot of resources. And by resources, I don't mean only money. I think that everyone who works in the civil society, you know that money is the, it's, it's the, the thing that we are lacking the most, but then people is the thing that we need the most. So we need both money, funding, but also we need people and we need time in order to make all of this uh, happen. I think that uh, today was a very clear example. There is a lot of potential in Ukraine. There is also a lot of support outside of Ukraine, and we need to make this match work in the long run, because at the end, the good always wins. And I'm sure that there will be time where we'll meet here again and we'll have more good practices to share and we'll have more good stories to share. And uh, in that day, Vare can also show a few new pictures from where she lives now and can invite us to visit her in uh, Uzgorot or in Mukachevo. Thank you very much for being with us here. And uh, I hope it was as useful for each of you as it was for me. And thank you for uh, trusting with your time today. So thank you.